archive data search active. Keywords, global, warming. The United States is trying to cope with the worst drought for 50 years. Some states are drier than they've been since the Great Dust Bowl disaster of the 1930s, and thousands of farmers are facing ruin. In Bangladesh have now claimed almost 500 lives. Half a million people have had their homes swept away, and millions more are marooned in their villages surrounded by water. British submarines sailing under the Arctic Circle have collected evidence that the polar ice is melting much faster than previously thought. Scientists say it's the first concrete evidence of the effect of global warming. Britain's rescue services are working through the night before another severe storm hits parts of the country tomorrow. In the United States, around 700 people are now believed to have died as a result of the week-long heat wave and it's feared more victims will be discovered in the coming days. Search complete. Global warming. Location, London, year 2050. Simulation. Prediction. Flooding, 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 flooding. Disaster isn't likely to strike in the very near future but global warming is giving genuine cause for concern. Scientists generally agree that the Earth has warmed by about half a degree over the last century. But there's less agreement about why this has happened, how much warming we'll see in the future, and what the knock-on effects of any increase in global temperature might be. With all this uncertainty, should we be taking steps now to prevent further global warming in the future? The Earth's temperature varies between night and day, from one season to another, and from the poles to the equator. But our planet has an average global temperature of about 15 Celsius. The Earth is kept warm by the gases in the atmosphere. Without them, it would be over 20 degrees below zero, which is far too cold to support life. We don't know for certain how the early atmosphere evolved, but we can make intelligent guesses based on evidence from rocks and fossils. We think that about 4,600 million years ago, the Earth evolved from a swirling mass of dust and gases, just like Jupiter is today. The early Earth would have been a molten mass of volcanoes and hot magma. We think that its atmosphere would have consisted mainly of carbon dioxide and water, because these are the gases given out by volcanoes today. Levels of oxygen built up very slowly. When there was enough, about 600 million years ago, then life exploded on this planet, and since then, the atmosphere has hardly changed at all. The Earth's atmosphere helps it to retain energy, which arrives from the Sun in the form of electromagnetic waves. Most of these waves have very short wavelengths, like the ultraviolet radiation which gives you a suntan. Some radiation is reflected back into space, but most of it is absorbed by the Earth's surface. This has a warming effect. Like any warm object, the Earth's surface radiates heat. The radiation goes back out towards space, but this time the radiation is of a longer wavelength. It's in the infrared part of the electromagnetic spectrum. This results in a cooling effect, but some of the infrared waves are trapped by certain gases in the atmosphere. This radiation is then re-emitted, and some of it gets back to the Earth's surface so the atmosphere keeps the Earth's surface warmer than it would be otherwise. This is the greenhouse effect. Overall, the Earth and its atmosphere receive and give off exactly the same amount of radiation, so the Earth stays at a steady temperature. But without the greenhouse effect, this temperature would be much lower. The atmosphere is 78% nitrogen and 21% oxygen. The gases that cause the greenhouse effect are contained in the remaining 1%. The main ones are carbon dioxide, methane and water vapour. Although the greenhouse gases form a tiny proportion of the atmosphere, they are vital to our survival. Over the last century, industrial nations have been releasing more and more CO2 by burning fossil fuels like oil and coal. 
scientists in Hawaii have been making precise measurements of atmospheric carbon dioxide since the 1950s. The peaks and troughs reflect the seasons each year, but the general trend is an increase in carbon dioxide levels, and it's this greenhouse gas that scientists are most concerned about. If additional carbon dioxide is a natural greenhouse effect, and scientists predict an increase in average global temperature of between 1 and 5 degrees by the end of the next century. But where's the evidence? How do we know that greater CO2 levels in the atmosphere are associated with an increase in temperature? The answer lies locked deep in the ice layers of the polar regions. This is an ice core from Antarctica. Each year in the Antarctic, snowfall traps a sample of the atmosphere. Deep within the ice, it can be several hundred thousand years old, and within bubbles in the ice are samples of the ancient air. For the people studying past climate, Antarctica really is a very special laboratory. It's very remote from anywhere else, and it's largely untouched by human activity. This makes it we do. And its remoteness means that we tend to get a global view of the temperature change, not a purely local one. The other thing is we can go time after time. The ice is there forever. As our techniques improve, we can go back again and again to collect more ice cores. We're brought back from the Antarctic for analysis. The first step is cutting them on the saw. We then have to extract the gas from the air bubbles. If you look very carefully, you'll be able to see the air bubbles. Each of these is a bubble of the ancient atmosphere. Normally, you would extract the gas in very controlled circumstances. But here, if I just warm it set carefully for you, you may be able to hear the little bubbles popping. From the composition of the air trapped in bubbles in the ice, we can tell what levels of gases were in the atmosphere in the past. In particular, we're interested in carbon dioxide and, and methane, the two main greenhouse gases. But also, by careful analysis of the meltwater itself, we can tell the temperature history over the same period. Here I have a graph of the temperature and the carbon dioxide over the last 160,000 years. You can see that in general there's broad agreement between the two, when the carbon dioxide levels are high the temperature is high. In the colder ice age period, the carbon dioxide is significantly lower. If we concentrate for a moment on this last 10,000 years, you can see that the temperature variation has been remarkably low. A lot lower than the increase we might expect over the next 100 years from greenhouse warming. However, if we go further back into the past, you can see the variability was a lot higher. For example, this peak here shows a temperature increase of maybe 8 or 10 degrees over a period of only a few tens of years. Now this is really quite remarkable, and it puts into perspective the next 100 year warming of two or three degrees. That is well within the climate variability that we have seen over this longer period of time. We're pretty confident of carbon dioxide data we've taken from our ice cores. We'd like to go further back into the past now, and for that we need data from deep sea sediments and perhaps even tree rings. These are tree rings in a piece of fossil wood. And the interesting thing about this wood is that these rings are extremely narrow, less than a millimetre, and we need to use a microscope to study wood, which is old, tied to stone. And we can tell from these narrow rings that this tree must have grown very slowly under a cold climate. And if we compare that from a tree growing in England today, we can see that these rings are much wider and the climate was much warmer. It's from the study of tree rings that we can tell that throughout Earth history, the climate really that the composition of the atmosphere on the climate also has an important role to play. The oceans cover over two thirds of the Earth's surface. They have a major effect on the Earth's climate. They're important because they the ocean waters, waters around the Earth in ocean currents. They also contain large amounts both as marine and carbon data, as marine and the complex carbon cycle. The level of carbon dioxide in the air depends on many different processes. Both uses carbon dioxide as a raw material to produce sugars, so plants take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. 
Both animals and plants get their energy by respiration, a chemical reaction which releases carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Carbon dioxide dissolves in the ocean, but this is a two-way process. When the sea gets warmer, some of the carbon dioxide comes out of solution and passes back into the atmosphere. Natural processes like these balance out, so that the tiny percentage of carbon dioxide in the air is maintained. But human activity is now increasing carbon dioxide levels. Deforestation means fewer plants are photosynthesizing, so more carbon dioxide is left in the atmosphere. The massive worldwide need for cement production, and most importantly, the burning of fossil fuels, also lead to an increase in carbon dioxide. Humans are disturbing the balance of the atmosphere. The increased atmospheric carbon dioxide caused by human activities could be responsible for global warming. But we know from ice cores and tree rings that the Earth's temperature fluctuated quite dramatically even before it was inhabited. So is our industrialised society to blame, or would warming be happening anyway? CO2 is the greenhouse gas produced in the largest quantities by human activity. We produce over 6 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide every year. And what's more, it's a greenhouse gas that lasts for a very long time in the atmosphere, over decades and decades. We therefore think of it as the main culprit in the human-induced greenhouse effect. An alternative point of view is that changes in the sun are more important than changes in the Earth's atmosphere. Sunspots are fierce magnetic storms on the sun's surface, and it may be that a peak in sunspot activity is responsible for global warming. There is no evidence that greenhouse gases is leading to global warming. Of the half degree centigrade increase in temperature over the last hundred or so years, most of that occurred before 1940, where gases have been emitted after 1940. The correlation doesn't look good. Whereas the link between temperature change and the sun's activities is much higher. Perhaps we should be looking at the sun for our explanation of temperature change rather than greenhouse gases. Scientists estimate that it will be at least 15 years until they have enough evidence to know for sure whether human activity is responsible for global warming. But by then it may be too late to change our lifestyle to reduce carbon dioxide levels. So we need to be able to make predictions now. Stand by, Suzanne. The weather forecasts that we make every day are based on sophisticated measurements and calculations. For this, and to predict climate change over decades, we need a highly complicated model which can only be run on the latest supercomputers. A computer model uses mathematical equations to simulate a complicated system like the Earth's climate. If we can design our models to successfully reproduce today's climate, and in fact changes that have occurred in the recent past, like the half a degree warming that has happened over the last 100 years or so, then we can have more confidence in the predictions of future climate change. We know that human activity is increasing the amount of greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and we have used this information to run our model into the future. What we can see on the screen is the global temperature from the start of the Industrial Revolution in 1860 to the present day and then into the future. The blue line shows the result of our model simulation and the red line is the observations over the period 1860 to the present day. What we can see is that whilst the model and the observations agree over much of the period, the model tends to simulate too large a warming from about 1950 onwards. What we haven't included in this model is the effects of sulphate particles. Sulphate particles reflect the sun's radiation and cool climate. They are naturally emitted by volcanic eruptions, but also from human activities like the burning of fossil fuels. When we include these into our model, we get this new simulation, the green line. And as you can see, this agrees much better with the observations over the whole period. The climate is naturally a very chaotic system. And this means that we can never hope to get an exact fit to the observations. Our models are already very complicated and we are continually striving to improve them. And they are certainly our best tools for making predictions of future climate change. 
The most pessimistic predictions are that global warming will continue and produce catastrophic changes to the weather and climate of the Earth. Some regions will become drier, increasing the threat of fire, while others will become wetter, affecting plant and animal life. Changes in insect populations could expose millions more people to diseases like malaria, and rising sea levels will cause flooding on a massive scale. So as we approach the end of the 20th century, there's still some debate about why global warming is happening and whether it will have catastrophic effects. The question is, can we afford to wait to find out? What we have at the moment is tantamount to a suicide pact with the Earth because we're committed to burning millions of tonnes of oil and coal despite the fact that the best scientific evidence suggests that the CO2 from that oil and coal will result in a runaway greenhouse effect. Greenhouse gases that we emit now will be in the atmosphere for many, many years to come and the response of the climate will take many years to appear. In those circumstances, it pays to give yourself maximum room for manoeuvre in the future until you know more about what will happen. And you do that by restraining, wherever feasible, the emissions of greenhouse gases. Trying to curb our use of energy is extremely problematic. The government recently tried to impose a 17.5% tax on domestic heating, but failed because people said that the poor would be hurt extremely badly from this tax. Energy taxes hurt the poor most. Trying to reduce greenhouse gases by as much as 20% would require a tax of up to 400%. That is extremely difficult to do, and it doesn't look promising. I don't think it's likely to happen. As a scientist, my role is to provide scientific information to the government, who then decide environmental policies for the country. But obviously, on an individual level, we can all make a difference by being more energy conscious and using less energy in our daily lives. Some people have suggested that we could use the cooling effect of sulphate particles to counteract the warming due to greenhouse gases. It's very dangerous to try and fight pollution with pollution. And the bottom line is that we must all accept our responsibility in the planet. We know that during Earth history, the climate has fluctuated between extremes of intense glaciation when there were major ice caps on Earth to former greenhouse periods when there was no ice at all on Earth but instead forests and even dinosaurs lived at the poles. We know that the planet can cope with these extremes, but the big question is, can we?